Breaking news from Baltimore. The governor, Larry Hogan, now meeting with his top advisors. We will hear from him in one hour, and you'll see it live here. And oftentimes, these press conferences where we get our own best information. You'll watch it live here on Fox. In the meantime, there's another story developing about how these hundreds of uh, teenagers were communicating online and were beating police to places like that shopping mall. Right now, there's an analysis underway as to figure out how this happened and how you can beat them to that spot. Catherine Herridge is more on that. She's live in Washington. And Catherine, what have you found out in these early hours? Well, Bill, a review of the social media traffic in downtown Baltimore Monday night has found striking connections to the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, according to a leading data mining firm that shared its findings exclusively with Fox News. The firm Babel Street, that also does data analysis for government entities, found as many as 50 social media accounts in Baltimore that were also tied to the peak period of violence in Ferguson, Missouri. While the data is still being refined, it suggests the presence of professional protesters or anarchists taking advantage of Freddie Gray's death to incite more violence. The data set in Ferguson was collected before the verdict and up until two days after the violence subsided. And the data in Baltimore was collected through 6 p.m. Eastern Monday, three hours into the peak violence. The finding that as many as 50 social media accounts were tied to cities 825 miles apart was described to Fox News as surprising. And while there's always the potential to spoof these accounts to make it appear someone is in one place when they're really in another, Fox News is told that that cannot fully explain the numbers involved here, Bill. Well, did this firm give you specific examples in that analysis, Catherine? Well, they did. Some of these Twitter accounts don't call for outright violence, Bill, but at the very least, their messages are menacing and ominous. One account that also tracked a recent food worker union protest in New York City tweeted photos of Freddie Gray's funeral, writing, The casket is closed, but the feeling in the room is that this is far from over. Another tweet, Lord, we don't thank you for what happened, but we thank you for what's going to happen. Separately, in another sign of how social media is being used, ISIS has hijacked the Baltimore riots and hashtag Baltimore Purge to promote one of its upcoming videos out of its stronghold in Yemen, Bill. Well, all fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. Thank you, Catherine Harridge, working welcome. that story today in Washington. And within the last hour, this data mining specialist is reporting that there is a new spike in activity in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, as well as New York City, of these so-called protesters looking for rise to Baltimore, further suggesting that this may not be over yet. convulsed by violence. Molotov cocktails pitched battles between protesters and police. A capital city spiraling out of control. And amid it all, it's the radicals and extremists who are spearheading this violence. Yeah, well, the play on victimhood here is very important. Maybe we can return to, to that question a little bit later. But uh, I, again, I guess I return to the uh, the motive of, of expansion of Israel and, and, and the idea that they want to try to, uh, you know, obviously weaken the other uh, states around Israel in the Middle, in, in the Middle East, etc. Because this, what you write about in the book, is, is a lot about how they managed to drag America into this war with the aid of the, 
the neocons and, and, and everything else that, that on, on faulty evidence really uh, tried to pin something like 9-11 on I Iraq, which was completely wrong, of course, but they managed to pull it off nonetheless, right? Well, yeah, in order to do that, and uh, you needed to dominate what, uh, what a former defense secretary named Robert Gates, I think, aptly named the people, he called them the people in between, uh, when you're, which is a very generic, uh, non-ethnic uh, sort of term. And he said, when you're waging unconventional warfare, and it's only unconventional to those on whom the war is being waged. And that war is being waged against the American public. is one of their great victims in this. What you do is you, you put your operatives in that in-between space. If you have a democracy, or what little remains of it, and you, and you want to have a system of governance based on facts and the rule of law, then it's essential that you have access to the facts in order to have informed consent, in order to know who to vote for, what what to em embrace, that sort of thing. And, and so what you what this this group did, the syndicate, is they focused an enormous amount of attention on dominating uh, media, which is a huge in-between domain. If you turn on CNN and you get Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, 17 years with the Jerusalem Post, when he's talking about anything other than the Middle East, you get pretty straight news. If you go anywhere near that, you're not getting straight news. I'm sorry, you're just not. And you're seeing, you see that now with the ongoing, uh, with what's happened in the post sort of Paris uh, environment. But if you focus on, on advancing a narrative through dominance in uh, media, in pop culture, in politics, uh, in think tanks, in education, those five key domains, then you can induce people to, to embrace a narrative that they themselves can't really see that they're uh, embracing because it's the screen the sort of frame through which they now perceive their world. So we, you notice how we segued seamlessly from a cold war fighting the people who hate our values into a war on terrorism fighting against people who hate our values. <laughs> yeah. And yet the, 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 the values that are being undermined are the very values on which the country was founded and they're in serious jeopardy right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Tell us more about those five domains again. Let's repeat those again and see what, what areas that people are manipulated within? Well, media being the most obvious. Uh, here, um, Canada, of course, was the Izzy Asper clan and, and, uh, and the black, uh, Conrad Black and that crowd. Here, it's the, you know, the media uh, dominance. All you need to do is turn on the news channels and, and look at the, the uh, leadership within media. And if you go to pop culture, it's helpful, and particularly in film, if you want me to embrace a narrative, it helps if you can sort of pre-stage that narrative through a, you know, numerous storylines that attract me into look at, look at a screen and go, oh, that's very interesting. And then and suddenly that storyline becomes a, a reality. And <laughs> By the time you embed this um, this sort of um, fiction, uh, you know, in in enough mindsets, then suddenly you've got this shared mindset that becomes a consensus, and then you you embed that consensus in politics and media and, and education and whatnot, and suddenly worldwide you've got the emergence of what we've now got. The strategic toppling of various leaders and countries in the Middle East have kind of changed a bit uh, since Iraq and Afghanistan, which was one method of doing it. I think what we've seen now in, uh, you know, Libya and Egypt, and of course, which has, you know, now kind of spiraled out of control a bit in Syria and Iran too, is that, you know, um, the groups that we're talking about is basically largely through the West and NATO, et cetera, kind of funding various revolutionary groups. This is basically basically how uh, Al-Qaeda arose uh, with the war between Afghanistan and Russia. We now have ISIS and these organizations, you know, whoever might be at the top of that, uh, controlling them, that that could be debated, but they're kind of running amok. But point being, they're being sponsored by the West in an, in an effort to try to, uh, you know, detopple them. And it, and it did work in a country like Libya. So what nature do you think a conflict with Iran would would do? Would they do the same thing? We kind of saw, you know, Twitter and the social media being part of this, of bringing out people onto the 
the squares of the capitals in the city and demanding these leaders to uh, step down, etc. Is that the nature of a war with Iran? In truth, we've sort of been at uh, war with Iran for at least since 79, uh, with the so-called um, you know, revolution there. Uh, but keep in mind, if you back up a little further, uh, when George Herbert Walker Bush was the, um, was the uh, CIA director, uh, he fired the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, as is our source of intelligence in the region, including our intelligence in Iran. Because he found, as with everything that we found coming out of Tel Aviv, for the most part, they were lying to us. They were putting their interest ahead of ours, which is to be expected if you're, you know, if you're an intelligence agency for a particular nation state, I would want my CIA to put my interest ahead of Israel. Uh, at the same time, um, that's the that's the problem here because the this entangled alliance that we have, and we've been we were urged not to do this, dating back to George Washington, is to do not do this, and we did it anyway. Uh, that we've had people manipulate our intelligence to take us to war. Now, what that would look like, I mean, we were we worked with the Israelis on the on the cyber warfare that helped, um, you know, the Stuxnet virus that helped, uh, you know, run those uh, centrifuges too fast where they burned out in Iran's uh, facility. Yeah. So that, if that isn't a raging war, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's right. So, we, we, so we've been at war with, with Iran. Uh, the, the question is, uh, in, you know, Kui Bono, Kui Bono who, who really benefits if we go to war with Iran? And it's not clear that it's us, meaning the United States and Americans. It is very clear that the war in Iraq, uh, the, the, the greatest beneficiator of, those, of it was those who took us to war in Iraq. And you don't have to dig very deep to find who that was and who cooked the intelligence and who, who, uh, who brought Ahmad Chalabi over here from the, the Iraqi fellow who provided all that false intelligence or who featured him, Judith Miller, on the front page of the New York Times to sell us that narrative. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident enough in the facts that can now be mustered that I think this, this next war can be uh, short-circuited. Uh, I hope, <laughs> hope facts don't make a liar of me. <laughs> uh, but um, the war with Iran is ongoing. I mean, what we usually think of as a war is when we send cruise missiles and to hit the, you know, a uh, hit a facility or when we take some uh, bunker buster bombs and drop them on one of their nuclear sites, which is too deep to be impacted by it. But that's a population of 80 million people. Uh, we will further outrage the entirety of the Muslim world, well, at least the the, the uh, Shia portion of the Muslim world, and um, and this and this war will um, metastasize and uh, metastasize into something else. So yeah. here's hoping if we if we if if those doing this cannot persuade us to take on this next war, we will get enough stability. I hope that we will uncover who has done all of this. You have to keep this ongoing turmoil and, and, and keep the eye off the ball in order not to have this investigated. And with, uh, you know, with, with Bibi Netanyahu coming to town to sell us on the war along with John Boehner, I mean, what could be better than that? So let's hope, we'll, let's hope that's what it takes to wake us up. Now, do you take the view that a lot of these um, so-called terrorist acts that have occurred, Paris included, uh, actually might have some links to uh, various intelligence services that this, uh, these are false flag uh, attacks in order to justify the continuation of the conflict that we now see. Because obviously we see, and even if that's not the case or not, we definitely could see who's trying to use the situation in that capacity. But I wouldn't put it past them with the history of, uh, you know, Gladio and other things like that, especially within uh, in Europe. Well, the, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo, I mean, I, the best commentary I saw on it um, was two fellows. One of them uh, said that if, if, if that editor was not such a narcissist, he'd still be alive. The other one said if he weren't such a blockhead, he wouldn't have attracted the the violence that killed him and his colleagues. Um, now, I would go, I would take it beyond that. Charlie Hebdo published the, you know, the same cartoons that set off the cartoon crisis in 2006 when the when its Danish counterpart, again, run, run by this... Uh, Jewish fellow, and forgive me, that's just the fact of the matter. You don't have to apologize for that. That's reality. But, yeah. You know, published, you know, cartoons with, a, you know, Muhammad with a bomb for turban, all that sort of thing. Now, it's all very cute, and I'm sure, you know, French culture likes this kind of stuff, but, you know, but the notion of free speech and, and, and whatnot came with also the notion you'd have some discretion. You know, you don't, you don't yell fire in a movie theater, you know, and so the, the extent to which they'd already been firebombed once, 
They had guards around them. They had a, a credible, you know, threats beforehand. So once that happened, and I think this goes to the second part of your piece, once the once the 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 uh, these people were attacked by these Islamic terrorists, uh, then uh, then yes, it definitely was used to advance an agenda. It wasn't a terrorist attack. It was an anti-Semite attack. It was, it was let's dispatch 10,000 uh, French troops to guard synagogues and Jewish schools. Let's let's hype this um, this notion that it's really the you know the an attack on on uh, civilization. I mean, I don't know if you re- recall, but in order to brand the Taliban in March of 2001, there was an attack on the Buddhas at Bamiyan. These are sure. these ancient Buddhas yeah. on the Silk Road and outside of Kabul. And it was telling that they were that when that no one really I knew, I knew who the Taliban was you probably did but people who don't pay much attention to these things had no idea who they were. Suddenly you had an evildoer you had a credible evildoer that done this awful thing. But it was telling to me that it was described in the American press as a cultural holocaust. Hmm. Okay, so you suddenly had this branding of these evildoers who in fact came online six months later and and you know there there we are. So you've got, I think, again, an, an, an attempt to take an incident that was, you know, foreseeable as anything, um, uh, and uh, and turning it to to this uh, to advance this narrative. Now we'll find out in time whether uh, whether indeed there it was some kind of a false flag. Who knows? And and uh, but it's it's interesting that one of the two fellows was at one time a roommate of the underwear bomber, yeah, uh, so-called right. underwear on Christmas Day, uh, what two thousand whatever it was. Um, a, a Nigerian who managed to walk through security at Shippel with no passport, having just bought a ticket for cash that had an had an incomprehensible uh, flight plan to get him to where he wanted to go, very indirectly. And he was walked he was walked through. And then you look into that, and I'm sure you've talked with people on your show who've covered this. And you look at the people who handled security for that for Shippel. Uh, were uh, an Israeli firm that was the same firm that had uh, a, a co-responsibility for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the security at Logan Airport in Boston uh, right. for 9/11. So I don't want to go there. I think that's all very interesting detail, and there are plenty of people digging into that. Who will, you know, in time that will all come to, you know, to to be whatever it is, and whether that's you know correlation or causation, we'll find in time. I think what's more important is to keep your eye on the ball, which is how this works in plain sight by by having you buy into a narrative and then take on an agenda that's really not in your long term interest. And, yeah. that, and that's very much that's very much back in play right now. And so it's very it's very disturbing uh, because it's um, it's a set of values that are very contrary to the values that uh, we think we are governed by. And um, and to even brush up against this uh, at all. And and identify the common source. The the great the great um, smokescreen is that you're uh, the and, and we predicted this in the book is you'll be charged as and this came from Noam Chomsky who I think whose analysis I think is 180 degrees off the mark. But he said it doesn't matter what the facts are. These are the original commissars, and I didn't realize he meant that literally. The original commissars. And it is literally the original commissars. He says the facts are irrelevant. You will be described as an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denier, and a Jew hater. Sure, yeah. And th- and and that's so unfortunate because the many of the large, the greatest victims of this are the broader Jewish population whose uh, whose identity as Jews has been manipulated by this very small group, many of whom just happen to have that same uh, ethnicity, but are not you know do not adhere to anything to do with the Jewish values or Judaism at all. They're largely agnostic or atheist. If you believe that Israel is an, is an ally, despite the facts, then they remain an ally. So part of this challenge has been to, to permeate that, that uh, you know, get in that in-between domain and say, look, here are the true facts. In politics, if you just look, if you just go down the list of those who've now uh, come to power and the key uh, agenda-setting committees, you'll get an idea of, of, of what has been done. And that's not to say that these people are consciously complicit. It's that they themselves believe that they're doing the Lord's work, so to speak, by advancing an agenda that's consistent with the, with the far right in Israel, that's inconsistent with our values, but we've been led to believe something very different. This sort of notion of, of what it is that we're fighting, and we're trying to make this very generic and show 
the repetitive behavior patterns and how and the sort of criminal behavior templates by which this works. You displace facts with manipulated beliefs. That's a classic one. You know, we, the, the five primary pieces of intelligence on which we relied to go to war in Iraq, none of them were true. Yet we all, yet we were led to believe that all of them were true. How does that happen? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, and so once you can get people to see how this works and they begin to see it themselves, I mean, there's no saying the best story wins. And these, the people being profiled are master myth makers and sophisticated storytellers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you, if you, if you concentrate on dominating that uh, in between space, then you've dominated the story. There's an old saying, and uh, again, in system science, you can't solve a problem until you know what the problem is. And, yeah, uh, that's right. So that's, that's, that's the, that's the immediate issue is to make sure people realize there is a problem and here's its uh, common source and quit, quit pretending it's otherwise and don't, uh, don't be intimidated by those who want to shut you up with a smoke screen that they've used on others because this is too serious. Just uh, keep in mind the second part of the title is also hugely important. It's how deception and self-deceit took us to war. The early, the easy, the first part is easy, but the self-deceit portion is far more sinister and often much more difficult for people to grasp. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the book provides the tools where people can begin to look in the mirror and say, "Oh my God, <laughs> am I am I unconsciously part of this?" But due to my own beliefs, and the short answer is yes. There's no excuse for the kind of violence that we saw yesterday. Um, it is counterproductive. Uh, when individuals get crowbars and start prying open doors to loot, uh, they're not protesting. They're not making a statement. They're stealing. When they burn down a building, they're committing arson. And they're destroying and undermining uh, businesses and opportunities in their own communities uh, that rob uh, jobs and opportunity from uh, people in that area. So uh, it is entirely appropriate that uh, the mayor of Baltimore, who I spoke to yesterday, and the governor, who I spoke to yesterday, uh, work to stop that kind of senseless uh, violence and destruction. That is not a protest. That is not a statement. It's people, a handful of people taking advantage of the situation for their own purposes, and uh, they need to be treated as criminals. <laughs> 